Good afternoon, and welcome to uh, phonetics again. Um, so this is our next lecture following uh, learning about basic acoustics. Um, and so today we're going to be learning about vowel acoustics. So last time we learned some of the basics about um, different types of sound waves, um, a periodic, periodic, and uh, simple and complex periodic sound waves. And so today we're going to build on that, and until we get a good understanding of how uh, vowels work, um, acoustically speaking. Uh, so what are the acoustic properties of vowels? Um, and so there are a few things we're going to do in these slides. Um, we're actually splitting these in half, so today we're only going to get to the first part of this. So we're going to talk about the source filter theory, and today's lecture is going to focus on the source of sound. Um, and we'll talk about the filter next time, which is actually how we get different vowels, but we're basically going to talk about the properties of the vocal tract itself, the vocal folds, I mean, um, themselves, and what they produce in terms of sound, acoustic sound, and then next time we'll talk about how that is filtered to get different vowels. Um, and then at the end, next time, we're not going to get to this today, but we'll talk about measuring vowel formants and prot, um, and how to make a vowel space from that data. That'll end up being one of your homework assignments, um, the next homework assignment. So, um, we're starting today talking about the source filter theory. Um, this is basically just a theory um, of how sound is produced um, by the vocal tract. Um, that what you have is a source, um, which you can see here on the bottom. That's the source. And the source is basically the vocal folds. It's the, it's the, uh, it's the part of the vocal tract that's actually producing sound. Um, and then you have a filter that is in some way uh, highlighting certain aspects of the source in different ways, diminishing some portions, um, exaggerating others in different ways at different frequencies. Um, and we'll of course get into very specifically how that um, works. So of course, so uh, as the source is the vocal folds, um, it's the only thing actually producing sound when you produce vowels. Your mouth itself is just shaping, uh, making different shapes, and that is uh, filtering the source, and that gives us different vowels. Um, but today, we're just going to talk about um, the source being the vocal folds um, and the acoustic uh, output that it produces. So the first uh, question you might have, um, you, you never actually get to hear um, the source without the filter because, well, quite fortunately, we have heads that are attached um, to our necks. Um, so anytime you produce any, any vowel sound, a, ah, e, a, o, u, you have the vibrations of the vocal fold being produced by um, vocal folds being produced by uh, the vocal folds in the throat there, and they're always going to be filtered in some way by the, by the vocal tract, um, the ways that you shape the tongue and the mouth in different ways to produce different vowels. So you can't actually really ever hear what the, um, what the vocal uh, folds would sound like without any kind of filter. Um, I believe they, they've done some kind of uh, gory um, experiments I've heard of before, um, like uh, they decapitated a cow and <laughs> had its vocal folds vibrate, and it sounded as they would have predicted, actually. Which, um, so if you're wondering then for humans, um, it would actually sound something like this. It actually just sounds kind of like a buzz noise, um, and um, so, you know, what is that exactly? Um, and we'll talk about the acoustic characteristics of that buzzing that's produced by the vocal folds. Um, but just uh, think about this for a second, remembering from last time we talked about uh, aperiodic noise and simple periodic and complex periodic noise or sound. Um, and what was uh, the type that is produced by the vocal folds, if you remember that from last time? And yes, so the vocal fold vibrations produce um, complex periodic waves. So it's something like a sine wave pattern, um, but we have multiple different component waves 
Um, so uh, you have this repeated pattern, a periodic wave, um, and uh, then it's made up of many component waves at different frequencies. So you probably wonder, okay, what are those frequencies anyway? And then uh, that make up the source of sound from the vocal tract. A lot of vibrating bodies, um, including uh, the vocal folds, produce what's called a harmonic series. And um, what that is, is that you have some kind of fundamental frequency. We'll keep it simple and say 100 hertz. Something like ah for me, probably ah around there would be 100 hertz approximately. And that's going to be the pitch that you perceive. But as I've said before, with the complex periodic sound waves, um, you have multiple different uh, frequencies simultaneously. So, um, whereas you have a fundamental, the lowest frequency here, then you have multiples of that frequency. So, of course, that's still going to be the lowest, the greatest common denominator, as we talked about last time, being the fundamental frequency. Um, so, whereas you get the fundamental at 100 hertz, you're going to also produce pitches at 200 hertz, 300 hertz, 400 hertz, 500 hertz, 600 hertz, and I think you can get the pattern by now, 700, 800, 900. It actually doesn't really end um, exactly, but they get quieter and quieter, and you can't really, um, can't really even pick up some of those pitches at some point, um, even instrumentally. Um, but anyway, so, uh, so whatever the fundamental is, it, uh, you get um, these frequencies at, at other equally spaced intervals all the way up the scale. And this, as I said, is referred to as a harmonic series. Um, and if I change my pitch, if I, you know, if my fundamental was ah uh, at 100 hertz, and I, instead I start at ah, uh, you know, which would probably be 150 or something like that, um, then uh, with a different fundamental frequency, you're going to get different uh, frequencies produced um, in addition to that fundamental. So I've still been uh, working around the term, uh, the terms we use for these different uh, component waves, the different frequencies that are produced. So we call this the fundamental, or F0, the lowest note, uh, the lowest frequency produced. And um, you call all of these together harmonics. Um, so the 100 uh, would be uh, the first harmonic, um, and then the second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic, so on and so forth. Another term that's sometimes used, sometimes used is overtones. Um, so in this case, whereas this is the first harmonic and this is the second one and this is the third, we would refer to the 200 hertz here as the first overtone, and the third as the harmonic as the second overtone, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's the terminology we use, and we refer to these individual um, component waves as the harmonics, making up the harmonic series. And that is um, what the vocal tract produces, um, a harmonic series, um, which uh, is then in some way, in some various ways, filtered by the vocal tract to produce different vowels. But I want to say a little bit more about this, in fact, a lot more about this, about the nature of um, this harmonic series that's produced by the vocal tract. Um, you probably are wondering, might be wondering, um, how is it that you get these different frequencies all produced at the same time? You know, it's not like you have a whole array of different um, vibrating vocal folds or anything like this, or strings that are being plucked or something like this. You've just got your vocal folds um, vibrating against each other. So how is it that they're actually producing almost like an infinite number of pitches, actually? And so this is a little bit of a complicated question, but um, we can think about it. Um, instead of thinking about the vocal folds, we're going to talk about um, a string vibrating. Because even though it's a little bit different, it's uh, analogous to what we're talking about with the vocal folds. So something very similar happens, even though we know that the vocal folds, or chords, you sometimes call them, are not actually strings that are just vibrating, such as would be the case with like a guitar string or something like this. So anyway, if you have a string, and it's 
tied down at both ends so it can't move at either end, just like a guitar string or on a piano string, and I'm going to show you uh, this in a minute. Um, but uh, so it can vibrate, you can pluck it and it'll vibrate up and down as you see um, also there in the slides, um, and that will produce basically its fundamental frequency. So you uh, pluck it, it produces some tone, um, and it can vibrate in this way. So it moves a lot in the middle and it can't move at all at either end um, because it's 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 tied down, It's uh, it, it can't move at these endpoints. Um, so it can vibrate in this way, um, like the whole string vibrating. But it can actually also, at the same time, vibrate like this just as easily, um, where you get a lot of movement here and here, and not really much movement actually in the middle. Um, it has the flexibility to vibrate like that, and uh, um, in a stable way, it can keep doing this over time because it's only tacked down on both ends. Um, it can freely move in this pattern um, on and on and on. Uh, and the same thing can occur with any multiple um, that fits perfectly within the length of this string. Um, so uh, it's going to be a little hard for me to get three just right here, but it can also vibrate three times as fast and fit into that string such that you get this stable vibration um, uh, throughout the entire time that the string is vibrating. Um, and you can see then that any multiple, so it can vibrate at uh, the full length or uh, two times or three times or four times or five times. This is looking a lot like, you know, our harmonic series that we talked about before. Um, and uh, these frequent, these uh, different vibrations produce frequencies um, that are multiples of whatever the fundamental is. Um, so this is very similar uh, to um, you know what we were talking about a minute ago. So um, if let's say this particular string, um, the fundamental, you pluck it um, and vibrating like the first um, uh, motion that we discussed there, uh, produces a frequency of 100 hertz then vibrating twice as fast is going to be at 200 hertz, and then three times as fast at 300 hertz. So it's very limited in the range of frequencies that it can produce. Um, they're going to be all multiples, perfect multiples of uh, the fundamental. Now you may, if you're still confused, you might be wondering about like why can't it vibrate at 150 hertz or something like that. Well, if it's at this length to vibrate at 150 hertz, you would get some pattern that looks like this, um, maybe, uh, where the wave is like two, uh, two thirds um, as long as uh, for the fundamental. Um, and you see there, this would, to vibrate in such a way, it would have to move a whole lot at, at the node here at the end. Um, and it can't do that in any stable way. Um, I mean, it can move like this, but um, because it's tacked down at both ends, it has a limit to how it can move. So, it, you know, the string is flapping around in all these different, uh, in this, this kind of pattern here, where it actually is simultaneously vibrating in all of these ways. Um, and, uh, yeah, just to show this as well, um, you might wonder, okay, how is it, you know, how is it moving in all of these different ways at once? So this is a good representation here you see um, the first harmonic, uh, how that movement is, and that's what I showed here um, with the whole movement of the string, and then moving twice as fast, you see that, um, the second harmonic there, and then the third harmonic. But you can actually just put those together in this kind of compound movement, which is what you see on the right. So you see, again, just the first harmonic moving, um, and then the first plus the second, and you start to get this kind of wave movement um, and then finally the first, second, and third together, and you keep adding them on, on and on and on. Um, so, uh, right, this is, um, this is actually how, you, you know, you, you, you wouldn't see a guitar string vibrate like you would see the second or the third harmonic. I mean, that would look very strange if, if you could even slow it down that much. Um, but it's actually, if you slowed it down, you would see its movement is much like the third one on the bottom here. Uh, with these first, second, and third harmonics all being added together. Um, 
and you see that kind of motion it's producing it's just adding all these three movements together and so it actually is vibrating in all of those ways simultaneously and um, likewise the vocal folds do something similar but different um, because of course we know they're kind of flaps hitting each other um, but they are also producing um, a, a movement like this that produces uh, vibrations at all of these different frequencies just the same as with a guitar string. Okay, so now we've talked about how, uh, how vibrations can occur um, such that uh, they can, uh, things like strings or the vocal folds can vibrate multiple, in multiple ways at once and produce this harmonic series. But now I want to talk a little bit about the sounds of the harmonics. Like, what do the harmonics sound like? I mean, when you hear me say, ah, you just hear, mm, you know, uh, that, that single pitch. You don't really hear a whole bunch of pitches simultaneously. And so I want to convince you that all of those pitches are there. Um, we can actually pull them out in various ways. And in fact, of course, as we're leading up to eventually, um, the fact that you can distinguish different vowels from each other is actually rooted in the, in the fact that there are multiple pitches being produced um, all at once. So um, I want to talk about what these different frequencies actually sound like. Um, so uh, let's again establish, um, let's do this maybe off of um, 110, uh, well I did 220 here or something like this. Um, so let's say 220 hertz um, is our fundamental frequency. Um, and we're going to move towards, towards, just for uh, a little while, thinking about this in terms of music, which may be really helpful for some of you and maybe it's like a whole new thing you have to learn for some other people. Um, but I think it's a good way to incorporate uh, different ways of thinking about pitches um, to get an overall understanding um, of how these things are working. So um, if your fundamental frequency was 220, I think I mentioned this last time that if you double that, you get something like 440, that would actually be um, the, the first overtone or the second harmonic. Um, and it's twice the, the fundamental there. So um, if you remember from last time, um, we said that if you double uh, a frequency like that, you actually get an octave higher. So your, your fundamental, if that's bum, uh, your second harmonic is going to be bum, an octave higher. But um, if we double that again, let's say we want an octave higher than that, we're actually going to get 80. It's hard to see with my marker there, but uh, yeah, so that would be an octave higher. So if this, if this we're calling this A3, uh, this is A4, this is A5, these are just names given to keys on the piano so we know which octave we're talking about. So if we double 440 again, we're going to get 880. Um, and that's going to be bum, bum. Um, two octaves um, above the fundamental. But it seems like we skipped something, right? Because we were saying we just keep multiplying the fundamental. So I multiplied it by two here, but it's actually multiplied by four. So this is our first harmonic, our second, and then we jump to the fourth. So, okay, what's this missing one? Well, we know what the frequency should be. It should be 660. So, what about this frequency of 660? So that's actually what the third harmonic should be. And then actually, um, you know, if we go above that, we should get um, 220 plus 880, we should get um, something like 1100 would be our fifth. And again, that's not going to be an octave higher because an octave higher than 880 would be 1720 or something like that. I'm not sure. Whatever 880 times 2 is. <coughs> um, so there's obviously a lot of other pitches in there other than just octaves higher. And um, so I want to think uh, about what those are. Um, and I think it makes a little bit more sense to think about these in terms of music. So um, if you look at this slide, uh, you see a um, 1760, sorry, for the, uh, an octave higher than the 80, which would be actually our eighth harmonic. Um, and uh, so, yeah, you see, um, I, again, I've started with 220 um, here um, as our first uh, harmonic. Um, and then you keep adding 220 to gauge harmonic. 
Um, but if you look over at the musical interval given, um, we're not always adding an octave. So if you start at 220, that's going to be uh, the root, or we'll call that the fundamental frequency again. Um, and the first one, the 440, uh, is going to be an octave higher. But then the 660, which we said, uh oh, what's that? It seems to be somewhere in between um, being a whole octave higher, uh, that note and being an octave higher. Um, so the 660, our um, third harmonic, is actually a perfect fifth higher, well it's an octave and a perfect fifth higher than the fundamental. Um, then the fourth, as I said, uh, would be two octaves higher. And then the fifth harmonic would be two octaves and a major third. Um, I'm going to play these in a minute for you. Um, and I'm going to go uh, show you this on a piano. Um, but anyway, uh, you, you keep going higher and higher. The sixth harmonic um, would then be two octaves and a perfect fifth. Uh, then the seventh, two octaves and a minor seventh. You'll, you'll start to notice that these get closer and closer together. Um, and we'll hear that as well when I play some of these for you. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, because you, if you keep, you have to keep doubling um, something to get an octave, but we're not doubling, we're just adding the amount of the fundamental frequency. So all of these pitches are what form the harmonic series. So let me go show you um, some of these, uh, what the, har the harmonic series looks like um, on a piano. Hi, so welcome to uh, one of the piano's practice rooms in the Shepherd School of Music. Um, I'm going to show uh, what the fundamental frequency would look and sound like on the piano keyboard, um, <clears throat> and then the higher harmonics in a typical harmonic series. Um, so let me try to angle this towards the keyboard. So let's say we started with uh, down here. C being our fundamental, but we would know that an octave higher is the first uh, overtone or the second harmonic. So if this was, let's just to be simple, it's not really 100 hertz, but let's say it is 100 hertz, this would be 200 hertz. And then here we would have the third harmonic. And so then, uh, so we can go all the way up the harmonic series. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Um, and these are approximating. Uh, the pitches a bit, and I'll talk about that in a minute, minute um, because this is equal temperament tuning instead of just intonation. Um, but again, you can so here see that they're getting closer together on the keyboard, um, and also um, that the pitches are getting closer together. <laughs> So you'll notice with the harmonic series, if we put these as notes, they're getting closer and closer together. Um, you'll also notice, uh, I'm asking here, what about the first few harmonics um, in particular? Um, you see uh, we went up an octave, then we went up a perfect fifth, we went up a major third. Um, if you think about Western music, you might wonder, you know, do those have any importance in the harmonic system uh, that we use? And the answer is yes. The harmonious sounding, the consonant sounding pitches uh, on uh, which we base uh, Western harmony um, are some of those first harmonics. Um, so we get perfect fifths, dun dun, and major, major thirds, bum bum, uh, and those produce. Uh, you, you can play a third and a fifth simultaneously, dun 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 dun. Uh, and get a nice uh, harmonious consonant sounding chord. And a lot of the other notes that maybe don't line up with harmonics as well um, are used more for dissonance and you have to resolve to uh, these consonant chords. And uh, 
I might want to point out, especially if you're interested in music, otherwise maybe you can uh, skip through some of this uh, here. But you might notice um, that, uh, so a perfect fifth, if it's an A uh, as the root there or the fundamental frequency, then something like an E is going to be a perfect fifth higher, which we said might be something like our th uh, third harmonic. Um, and then we get um, two octaves and a major third higher, and that's something like our fifth, high, fifth harmonic. Um, and you'll actually notice the way that these are tuned normally on a piano um, are actually slightly off. Not by a whole lot, but you see some of the percentages here, the perfect fifth, which would be our E5 there, it's off a little bit of where it should naturally be, but only by minus 0.11%. Uh, we see that the C sharp 6 there, um, that should be our uh, two octaves and a third higher, and it's off by uh, actually a little bit there, 0.79%. Uh, um, and a lot of the other values then are off from what they would be, except we don't really use other, um, other intervals as harmonious intervals in Western music. Um, but, uh, so you might think about why is that, uh, that those uh, pitches are off? a bit from the natural harmonics because they're actually slightly sharp or slightly flat in relationship to a perfectly uh, uh, a perfect fifth which would vibrate at exactly three times the speed of the fundamental. And the reason for some of this imperfection um, in Western music is that um, it basically stems from the fact that uh, when you play music, you sometimes change to other keys. So if if you uh, if you tuned if we were an A again, um, and you turn uh, you tune that E to a perfectly harmonious fifth, um, when you modulate it uh, in, in, into the key of E, it would throw off the intervals for that key. Um, so what we've had to come up with is a tuning system where you take the octave and you break it up into equal intervals. And it so happens if you break up the notes of the octave into 12 parts equally, your third and your fifth, those notes that produce major chords, uh, consonant sounding chords um, in uh, music, in western music in particular, um, you get pretty close. I mean we saw those numbers weren't off by a whole lot, so these are not going to sound very far from a natural, uh, or what we would call a just intonation, third or fifth. Um, you can divide the octave up into 19 or 31 notes, people have done this before, and sometimes get a little bit closer in various ways, but at some point you just get too many notes and it doesn't work out very well. Um, so um, that's part of the reason why uh, some of these notes are a little off of where they should naturally be if we were thinking in terms of the harmonics, which we are, that's why they sound, sound harmonious. <laughs> um, fortunately the human ear can, uh, can sort of learn to hear those as being perfectly in tuned. So at this point I'm going to show you a few demonstrations on the computer, and I want to convince you of the fact that we actually do hear um, these different harmonics are actually produced by the voice, and for various reasons the ear um, perceives them the way that it does, so we don't really hear the individual harmonics when the vocal folds produce them. Um, so the first thing I want to show you, I'm just going to record my voice uh, on the computer. Um, I'm going to make a power spectrum, and I'm going to show you that actually all the different harmonics are there and present in uh, the vocal fat, the vocal uh, being produced by the vocal folds. Um, so I'm going to go to pra here. Um, I'm going to produce uh, I'm a recording here. So um, bum. Save to list and close. And I'm going to view and edit that, and we should see. Uh, the waveform at the top, and then the spectrogram. So it recorded. Um, now the spectrogram might look a little bit different at the bottom. Uh, you might have to change your settings. I want a narrow band spectrogram. Uh, by default it usually gives you a wide band. You might have 0 .005 here. You'll want to change that to 0 .03 to give you the narrow band spectrogram. It just makes the uh, individual harmonics 
more visible. Otherwise, with a wideband spectrogram, they're kind of blended in a little bit more, so you actually see the formants better. Um, but if you look at the spectrogram, um, you can sort of see uh, these individual ribbons here now, and each individual ribbon is actually one of the harmonics. Um, I don't mean this like dark band, that's actually kind of a formant, and we'll talk about uh, that later on, but individual little ribbons, um, those are the individual harmonics. Um, but I want to actually show you a power spectrum, so I did control L and that came up. And we see here in the power spectrum uh, that um, you see every single individual peak. So we know along the x-axis we have frequency this way, amplitude this way, but you actually get all of these different notes simultaneously, all of these different pitches. And if we look, the first one here, this is my fundamental, it's actually at, at about 100 hertz as it so uh, happens, and then we get 200, about 200, 300, 400, 500, I mean it's a little bit, apparently a little bit higher than 100 hertz is what I was on there, but um, you see every single harmonic, which are multiples of, of 100, which happen to be the pitch that I produced there. Um, so uh, you see some are louder than others. Um, you see as you go up real high, um, they get very quiet and kind of uh, fade out completely. Um, but they're all there. Uh, it's just we don't seem to perceive individual harmonics when we hear speech. We just hear a single pitch. So uh, the second demonstration, um, I want to continue uh, trying to convince you that all of these pitches are part of a harmonic series um, produced when uh, the vocal folds vibrate. Um, so here uh, I have in Audacity, um, I've made, uh, created sine waves, which we know are simple periodic uh, sound waves and at each of the different frequencies in a particular harmonic series. I believe this also begins with uh, 100 hertz. Um, and you'll hear um, that uh, uh, I'm going to play them all together and you're just going to hear kind of a buzz noise because the point is you don't actually perceive them individually. Um, you perceive them all together as one kind of sound object. So let me play them together. So you probably didn't hear that there are something like 15 different uh, individual pitches being produced there. Um, but let me uh, pull out individual harmonics here. I'll turn them up and then back down and you'll hear them kind of come out and then blend back in. So now the uh, second harmonic. The third. So we had bum, 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 and then up an octave again for that fourth. I can't quite hit that note. Uh, and then let's go a little higher and hear these other harmonics be pulled out. So there's the fifth. You hear like a major third. Fifth. There we have the seventh. No, <laughs> that note, but um, that one might sound a little almost strange to you there. Um, and then that's the eleventh. Ninth. So all of those, all of those uh, pitches are in there, um, and I think hopefully you could hear when uh, I pulled them out individually. They suddenly, you suddenly became aware of them. But then, as I turned them down, they just kind of blended back into the overall sound object, and you didn't perceive the harmonics individually. Okay. Um, so for a third demonstration here, um, I want to talk a little bit about overtone singing. Um, so this is actually uh, a method where 
if you do just the right thing with your mouth and make the right uh, constriction in the right place, you can actually bring out individual harmonics to be much louder than the other ones to the, to the point, kind of like I did uh, in the Audacity um, demonstration there, that you can actually hear uh, that harmonic perceive it as an indiv individual um, pitch. Um, again, to it maybe finally totally convince you that my voice right now is producing this uh, array of pitches all at once. Um, so, uh, yeah, let me just try this out here. Um, and uh, you might hear, and uh, might think about which harmonic you're hearing, or maybe I could um, indicate it if I can hold on to it. Um, so you might hear uh, like the fifth or the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh. These are some that I know I sometimes can get to come out. So <coughs> let me find a good note to start on. Um, bum, well, I'll try a few different ones. So, So you can hear those individual uh, notes being pulled out and amplified. I don't do it as well as some people. You can look at other videos here um, on YouTube. But uh, I might try uh, at a different pitch range. You might hear some of them louder. So there you go. I hope um, you were able to hear those. Um, all I'm doing is amplifying particular harmonics um, so that you're hearing them uh, as discrete pitches. Um, and they're all there. They're all being produced by my vocal folds. I'm just filtering uh, in different ways to produce different pitches. Um, we're going to talk about how this is related to vowels. I mean, you kind of, you, you, you probably saw my lips and uh, maybe my tongue moving around in different ways. Um, I'm just doing kind of an extreme form of producing the different vowels um, that we produce in speech uh, such that uh, you get distinct sounding vowels. Anyway, at this point I'm going to show you a little bit about harmonics being produced on a string. So now um, I'm going to play some of the notes on the keyboard and I want you to listen for the harmonics. Um, I'm going to play it on the keyboard first and then we'll try it later where you can press on the strings at the right points and uh, hear the harmonics come out. But some of the lower notes in particular, if, um, if I do it just right, hold the pedal just right, you can sometimes hear some of those other notes come out. So let me try that here. So. You hear at the end when I let up. Hear that brr kind of at the end. There, got some harmonics. So I kind of hear. I hear that one coming out. Kind of hear those notes in there. Hear that ring at the end? Those are the harmonics. Another thing I'm going to do now is um, if you press on just the right place, um, you can get the harmonic coming out. Basically, what you're doing is suppressing some of the other vibrations. So you have the entire length of the string um, vibrating, but if, say, I touch at a point halfway along the string, I can cut out the full length vibrations that I would otherwise get and it will amplify, for example, an octave higher. If I touch at about one third along the string, I can get the third harmonic coming out and so on and so forth. This is actually a really good way of getting the harmonics to come out. So let me find... So 
So there's um, the C M playing. So let's turn it on. There's a harmonic. It's the ninth. Let's see. Okay, I need to go down further this way. I'm just playing some of the different notes of the harmonic series. About a third of the way through the string, you're getting the fifth. You hear that? There's halfway. So you're hearing that. So you probably are wondering now, um, you don't normally hear these harmonics as distinct, uh, discrete pitches. Um, you just kind of hear the whole series together as a single voice. And the harmonics are actually, um, go into, uh, giving the timbre of different sounds. Um, like if you think about musical instruments and the ways that they sound different, that has to do with the harmonics. Um, and different harmonics being relatively louder or softer. Um, and it also, uh, but in a different way, um, gives us different vowel qualities. Um, different vowels are not really the same as different uh, timbres of instruments, um, but it's rooted in the same basic concept of you're basically amplifying different uh, harmonics. So for example, um, you get a very different sound if, you, if the uh, even versus the odd harmonics are amplified a little bit more relative to each other. So you'll hear that these are basically at the same pitch, the, some fundamental is the same, um, but uh, you'll notice that, um, that there's a very different sound quality to the noises. So here they are. Um, the first one is uh, even harmonics amplified. <laughs> And then the second one are the odd harmonics. So it's kind of just like a different sound quality, right? I mean, we call that timbre. Um, and uh, we don't, again, we don't really hear that the individual harmonics as discrete pitches. Um, we perceive it as one sound object going together. And another interesting thing I wanted to show real quick um, is this missing fundamental demonstration. So we, you know, harmonic series, it could be 100, 200, 300, 400, um, you know, based on a fundamental of 100 hertz. Um, but the funny thing is, when, if you remove that fundamental frequency, you still hear, you still hear it, um, because if you have all the rest of the har harmonics there, um, your brain knows what it should expect. Um, it's hearing all the harmonics of a certain fundamental, so your brain actually kind of fills it in. So if I bring up Audacity again, the same uh, buzzing noise, um, I'm just going to subtract 
the first and actually even a few harmonics and you should still hear that's basically a bum sound it changes in quality but you still hear that fundamental so there I muted the fundamental bum 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 <laughs> It changed, so I, I muted the first four harmonics, actually, and you still sort of heard bum. Um, this actually kind of explains why, um, if you listen to speech on, on the phone, or you are on some types of radios, you actually mostly only get higher, fun, uh, higher frequencies, the higher harmonics, um, but uh, you don't get a lot of bass <laughs> over the phone, for example. Um, but you still seem to hear things at the pitches that they're supposed to be at, um, and that's because you've got all the higher harmonics telling you what the fundamental should be. Because if you're hearing 300, 400, 500, 600, that kind of pattern, you are basically perceiving that as having a fundamental frequency of 100 hertz. Okay, so the last thing uh, I just wanted you to think about was, um, <laughs> you know, maybe why does the brain even do this? Um, you know, why is it grouping things, uh, all of these pitches together? And it's a very uh, useful um, skill that our ear and our brain have, um, because uh, if you think about this, looking um, at the slide here, um, well, it, again, if you were just hearing a single voice producing an ah, and you get all those different pitches, um, and you, if you actually perceive them as discrete pitches, it would be a lot of kind of processing to have to put that together and know that that's actually a single voice. Because imagine when you get multiple people speaking at the same time. So here um, on, on the uh, left, uh, I, I've given you two voices and you see a power spectrum. Uh, on the other side there you just get a spectrogram, so it's the same basic thing. Um, but you see that there's something at a certain interval going along at a smaller interval, and then you get the higher peaks there that are going maybe three and a half times faster, something like that. But you see a second pattern of things going at the same uh, at the same interval. And then this is a power spectrum, so we're talking about uh, one. There are two harmonic series on top of each other. Is basically what they are. So you see something that might be 100, 200, 300, 400, and then something that looks like it's like 350, 700, uh, 1050, or something like this. And so imagine you're hearing two people's voices at different pitches like this, and you heard all the individual harmonics, and you had to somehow um, group them together. Well, your brain automatically does that. It automatically uh, tries to find these these patterns where you have these equally spaced frequencies forming a harmonic series and it automatically just groups those together and you don't hear the harmonics as individual discrete pitches you hear those harmonics as timbre or, or vowel quality or some of these other different fe features that result from how the uh, higher fundament uh, the higher frequencies are um, being filtered in some way um, so um, that's all for today. Uh, I introduced uh, the source. Next time we're going to talk about the filter. So now we know about the type of acoustic output that the vocal folds produced. And so now we'll talk about um, how uh, the acoustic output is changed by changing, your, by changing the way that your mouth is shaped to produce different vowels. So uh, have a good day and I'll see you next time.